Hi, I'm David King from the Alt Weekly. I'm joined by Katie Cusack, and today we're honored to have Kathy Sheehan, mayor of Albany. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you're, you have lots to do in the city, uh, and you're actually coming into uh, Schenectady. Uh, you're in Proctor, so you're, you're out of your element. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's start with uh, one of the reasons you've made headlines lately. You uh, went on Tucker Carlson of Fox's show, who's known to be a bit of a firebrand, um, and you have been outspoken uh, in your position that Albany is a sanctuary city and uh, defending sort of the country's status as, as uh, friendly to immigrants. Um, what was it like being on the show, and, and why did you decide that it was worth taking on? Well... You know, I decided that it was worth taking on because I think it's really important to try to have a civil conversation and to talk to the country about what we mean when we say that we're a sanctuary city, why it's so important for Albany and I think for cities across the country to be welcoming to immigrants, and try to sort of lower the temperature on this debate because it really isn't a particularly controversial position that the city of Albany has. As a matter of fact, it's the constitutional position. It's the position that's been upheld by the Supreme Court with respect to the stance that we have taken. And it doesn't mean that we're hiding illegal immigrants in the basement. And it certainly doesn't mean that we're letting violent criminals free. If somebody breaks the law in the city of Albany, if they commit a crime in the city of Albany, they're going to be prosecuted regardless of their immigration status. And so I went on the show because I wanted to have the opportunity to have that dialogue, have that conversation, knowing that Tucker isn't exactly known as a dialogue kind of guy. <laughs> but I will say after both appearances that I had, I received emails from random Republicans, one from New Jersey, another from uh, somewhere in the middle of the country, who expressed to me that they appreciated my willingness to go on, and they said that while they didn't necessarily agree with all of my views, that they learned something, and that it was helpful in helping them understand the position that sanctuary cities are taking. And that was the goal. Um, I was going to ask um, what it meant for Albany to be put on this kind of platform um, and to be um, on sort of this like network news platform and be talking to the entire nation, um, putting us out there to say, you know, Albany stands for something. Um, you know, what does that mean for the city to you? Well, I look at my role as really being representative of the people who elected me. And one of the things that I know is that Albany is a welcoming city and that this is a place where we have a large refugee population and that we have to ensure that we are doing all that we can to send the message that this is a place where no matter where you come from, you are entitled to feel safe you're entitled to city services. You're entitled to call the police department if you are the victim of a crime. And you know, the other piece of this is that many of the immigrants who are legally in the city of Albany, thousands and thousands of legal immigrants, are refugees who have come here from war-torn countries where people in uniform and people in authority were not their friends. Mm -hmm. And so building trust is incredibly important. And so when you have someone like Tucker Carlson demonizing all immigrants, and let's be very clear, if you listen to his show, that is what he is doing. He is anti-immigrant, period. And so when you listen to that, it frightens people. And it makes them think that if, I, if they get pulled over for speeding, that they could be deported from this country. If they call and complain about an employer who is being abusive or who is not paying them the minimum wage, that they could be deported from the country. And so that's why I think it's so important that and we all benefit when we have a position that says that that law enforcement is not in the business of enforcing immigration law. That is a function of the federal government. Mm -hmm. And that when you call the police, the, pur the purpose and the, the, um, the local police department is not there to check on your immigration status or to drill you with questions about your immigration status. We're there to enforce 
local laws and to ensure that people are safe. Yes, we enforce state laws. Yes, we bring in the federal government when we think that federal crimes are happening in our city. And we cooperate with the federal government on many, many um, you know, uh, issues in law enforcement. But that the job of a police officer when they pull somebody over because they're speeding is to give them a speeding ticket, mm -hmm. not to ask them about their immigration status. Mm -hmm. I. I I'm wondering, given that uh, there was sort of a flirtation with ICE on the part of Craig Apple, and now we know that Sheriff Craig Apple, I should be clear, and now uh, the Rensselaer County Sheriff is actually going forward and, and pushing to sort of involve ICE in, in the county jail. Are you concerned that that could send uh, fear through the community in Albany? Um, I mean, obviously, this is the capital region, um, and we're all very close-knit. People are traveling back and forth. You know, for jobs, is, are you concerned at all that that could disrupt Albany Sanctuary City status or make it harder to, to give those services to? You know, I think that the separate thing there is mm -hmm. that what Albany County Jail is considering doing is, and what Craig was considering at that time mm -hmm. when he made that application but then withdrew it, is, again, it, it comes down to dollars. Uh, it's saying that, yes, we will, we will take... Um, immigrants who are arrested by ICE um, and we will hold them in detention we get paid by the federal government to do that not the city of Albany this is the, the county jail right. and in order to do that there were certain things that they needed to agree to uh, to be that location and so again you know in that scenario where you're getting money in ex direct money in exchange for holding uh, immigrants who are undocumented then there is that direct link the sanctuary city argument is a little bit different because that's the federal government and Donald Trump trying to connect federal funding that's not even necessarily directly law enforcement related to cities that have a policy of not asking and not being in on the front line of enforcing immigration law and those are two very different things well i mean so, some of that that agreement would have trained these folks in in recognizing and sort of going you know some of these communities did who who got that funding did send officers out to you know to act as sort of ice agents um and obviously i think the sheriff saw some of that and um the the sheriff in Rensselaer County is saying he won't be doing that. But at the same time, I just wonder if, if having ICE that close to us in a way they hadn't before might I, make things more difficult, you know, just on the ground. Look, I certainly think that we don't want to um, sow the seeds of confusion. Right. And, you know, when I talk to uh, folks who have different political views than I have, one of the things that I do talk about with respect to the enforcement of immigration laws is that what what the Trump administration is really asking is for uh, local police departments to become mini ICE enforcement officers. Yep. And they're not paying us to do it, right? It would be a different conversation in the community if we were told that the federal government wants to pay for us to hire new cops to go out and enforce immigration laws. That would be a different conversation, but that's not the conversation that's occurring. And it's appalling to me that, you know, as recently as yesterday, Donald Trump was saying, I should just pull ICE out of California because of all these sanctuary cities. That's like saying, we're not gonna send FEMA in when there's a natural disaster in a state because it's a blue state. Mm -hmm. Reprehensible, reprehensible. This is the federal government's job. It is not local law enforcement's job. And one of the examples that I give to folks who, uh, again, have different political views than me, is that was why a portion of the Brady Law was found unconstitutional. There was a portion of the Brady Law that required local law enforcement to do background checks for guns. It was a mandate that was associated with a federal law and the Constitution says and the Supreme Court found in that case that you could not mandate and require local law enforcement to enforce what is a federal right. uh, statutory requirement in a, re a regulatory requirement it's the same thing with respect to what we're doing in the city of Albany as a sanctuary city would you welcome funding from the federal government to I, I look I think that that separation mm -hmm. is really important because local law enforcement is focused on ensuring that people on the street are safe right and for every uh, undocumented immigrant that commits a crime uh, that gets you know spread across the headlines one thing that we know for certain is that um, immigrants and undocumented immigrants are less likely to commit crimes 
And we also know that for every person who's arrested for a crime, there are crime victims out there who haven't reported crimes Mm -hmm. because they're concerned about their documented status. That leaves a criminal out on the streets free to commit crimes again and again and again. And local law enforcement has said, and the people who do this on a day in, day out basis say, we are all safer when people come forward, when they cooperate with law enforcement, when they report crimes, if they're a witness to a crime, when they're willing to come forward and talk to law enforcement about what they've seen and what they know. So are you saying then that more of that, the kind of funding that you're talking about would, would make things worse then? I think that having local law enforcement play a federal role, I, I, I think that that money would be better spent um, on, in, uh, on increasing and on having, first of all, we need to fix immigration. Right. Okay, right. So, you know, we need to fix immigration policy. And mayors across the country, Democrat or Republican, are saying to Congress, fix this. You know, there's a Republican mayor who he, he and I both went on uh, the uh, PBS NewsHour. And here is this Republican mayor saying, I support making these DACA kids legal. Right. So this isn't particularly controversial among the mayors. We want federal immigration laws fixed. And then I do support ensuring that federal enforcement is there to enforce immigration laws. Mm. We want immigrants who shouldn't be here, immigrants who have committed crimes and should be deported to be deported. But you want it clearly separate. But I want it clearly separate, and I want the federal government to do their job, and I want the local law enforcement to be allowed to do their job. And I also think that aggressively going after people who are here who are not documented, who have committed no crimes and no serious crimes, is a waste of taxpayer dollars, and that we really need to be focused on what can we do to ensure that we're working on a pathway to uh, some sort of legal status for the immigrants who are here, who are working, and who are here because they want to provide a better lives for their families. So, so let me ask a question that might be a little out of left field. Um, but given what I've heard from people in Washington, given, I mean, basic media accounts, given um, what I've heard from other legislators in other states in our state, uh, there are people, and, and from what you've just said about your relationship with the governors, uh, is Donald Trump such an outlier that that he's taking this to such an extreme that most of the people who are doing the people's work in any state are disconnected from the direction he's going in? Or is he pulling people in that direction? I mean, do you find that... You know, I think that the rhetoric, particularly in conservative media, is creating a groundswell of anti-immigrant sentiment. And it is so disheartening to me. You know, I look at my personal experience with respect to immigration and to immigrants, and I think of the people who have started small businesses, that have grown into large businesses. I think about the advances that have been made in science and in engineering and in technology in this country. And I think of families that I know who proudly trace their roots back to an immigrant parent or grandparent who came to this country and made a better life for their family, some of them documented and some of them undocumented. I worked for a medical device manufacturer for 11 years, and that medical device manufacturing company was started by an immigrant who was in a concentration camp during World War II. His star is on display at the um, Jewish Center up on, off of Washington Avenue Extension. This is an immigrant who came here and who worked hard and who created a company that literally saves lives and makes medical devices that save people's lives. And so this is a country that at one point celebrated that. Mm-hmm. And the rhetoric that is out there that is fueled by Donald Trump and by conservative media is to me tearing at one of the core values that this entire country is based on and i am very concerned about it i think when you talk to people one-on-one when you have the opportunity to have the conversation really brings you back to your first question why did i go on tucker carlson 
because I, I want to be able to have that conversation because I think at their core, most people do believe that this is a country founded on immigrants. And the other thing is, look at the demographics. And I, I got to tell you, you know, the population growth that we have experienced in upstate New York has been driven significantly by immigrants, people who have arrived in this country and are helping our communities to grow and to fill jobs that uh, would go unfilled if we continue to have the population loss that we saw, you know, over the, you know, last few decades. And I mean, uh, covering having covered state government for as long as I did, it's interesting to see cities like Albany and Utica now share more values with New York City based on that immigrant population and based on seeing that entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit um, and sort of wanting to nurture it and and pushing back against, um, well, not Albany, but, you know, some of these western New York cities that perhaps one time would have been a different place on immigration are now realizing what it's done for their economy. I mean, it's sort of interesting that perhaps there's now more common ground across the state because of it, which is always sort of a relief. So we're not talking about, you know, kicking New York City to the curb or kicking upstate to the curb or whatever it is. No, but, uh, I think you're. that's a, that's a really great uh, silver lining out of all of this is that I do think that there are now people living – um, in communities that maybe didn't have uh, immigrant populations that were of any size that are seeing the benefits. And so, you know, I, I'd like to remain hopeful and I just hope that people can see through the rhetoric and recognize that we need to have sound policy. You know, quite candidly, this is also, again, if, you know, looking at the other side of the political spectrum, let's talk about tax dollars, right? Let's talk about the tax impact of taking an underground economy and bringing it into the light and recognizing that um, even undocumented immigrants spend billions of dollars in taxes. They, they pay sales tax, mm -hmm. right? You know, they, they are paying the gas tax. They, they pay taxes. And so imagine if we were able to have a pathway to some sort of documented status uh, and we're able to get the benefit of those additional income tax dollars, for example, if somebody's being paid under the table. So speaking of tax dollars, we're in a similar position this year. Um, last year, you were able to announce a candidacy. You, you know, your, your uh, campaign, re-election campaign, and have these dollars sort of a sigh of relief. The state had given the the, the, the city its due, and here we are again, back waiting. So I'm wondering, and I know it's probably not in your best interest to do so, but. Point, point a finger at someone. Tell, tell us why we're, we're always waiting uh, you know, and why this hasn't been addressed in a more permanent. I, I think it just it, it speaks to the challenge of putting together a budget in a state with tremendous diversity mm -hmm. and tremendous need and sort of, you know, parsing through the, the noise of how do you bring all of that together into a budget in a budget year that is a difficult budget year. And I believe firmly and passionately that we've made our case. And I've had conversations with the governor and with the governor's office and with the state budget department. And I think that we're gonna be able to get there. And we will then be proposing legislation this year so that it becomes a mm -hmm. permanent part of the state budget. And we're looking to uh, move that forward. So to get the 12 and a half million in this budget and to get permanent legislation, when I speak now to the Senate and Assembly, the Joint Finance Committee that meets, I don't get any pushback. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that there aren't skeptics out there, but I think that we have made the case. And I want to thank you know, the you know Assembly members and the senators who do see that there is this inherent inequity in the way that the city of Albany is treated. And I think the other piece of this is that we have demonstrated, I've really embraced this governor's call for municipalities to find ways to save money. And I think that if you look at what we've been able to do in the city of Albany, it is a demonstration of when you really focus on being more effective and efficient, when you pull together your employees and your leadership team and say, we need to do better, that we're able to do that. And so we've been able to find those savings. When you look at the budget that I proposed in 2015 and the budget that I proposed in 2018, it's a 0.02% increase over four years. So, you, know, you know, a little over $100,000. And we've had to absorb a multi-million dollar 
um, uh, interest arbitration award. We've been able to settle all of our union contracts with the exception of our uh, patrolmen who we are, police mm -hmm. department, who were in negotiations with and we want to be able to settle that contract. We've had to absorb increased insurance costs. So we've looked at where we can save and we've been able to drive a lot of savings into this budget uh, over the course of those four years and we're going to continue to do it. And the other interesting thing is the 12 and a half million hasn't changed. It was 12 and a half million in 2015 and it's 12 and a half million in 2018 and I think that that speaks to what I've been saying this is a structural gap mm -hmm. that is driven by whether you call it our tax exempt burden or the uh, you know the aim formula not really working properly anymore but it is a structural deficit that exists so talking about state government uh, a little bit more. We earlier you mentioned that that um, that you might be a little bit involved in the governor's efforts to push at, well Congress to to reclaim some some congressional seats. Um, what's that like? What are you targeting? In, uh, who, who, do you expect to be out on the road? Um, I mean, I we wrote this week about the NRA and you know sort of wanting to target <laughs> thinking that it's time for some of those folks to go um, some of those reps including John Faso and, and Elise Stefanik um, and I know gun violence is something that's impacted your life are you taking that into consideration at all when you when you look at, at um, the race the various congressional races in New York you know I want to be as helpful as I possibly mm -hmm. can be and so I stand ready to travel across the state to stump for whether it's flipping congressional seats, whether it is focusing on ensuring that we have a democratic, a, you know, democratic uh, majority in the Senate. So uh, really looking at where, um, you know, I can be helpful. And so I think that this is going to be a time for Democrats to really come together and to recognize that we've got to deliver a very clear message in this uh, election. And we've got to get back to our core values about being there for working families, about recognizing the struggles and the challenges that everyday families face, about recognizing the fact that we have more families, not fewer families, walking into the food pantries across the city of Albany. How are we going to address the issues that impact these families' lives? whether it's access to jobs, whether it's access to a better education, uh, whether it's access to health care that isn't going to bankrupt our families. Those are core democratic values, and that's what we need to get back to. And so I want to be able to work across the state and to uh, you know, make sure that we are focused on being part of what needs to happen across the country in order to, to flip Congress. Yeah, um, I also wanted to ask um, just about you know, families in Albany that have access to the sort of these basic needs, you know, health care, uh, jobs and such. And I wanted to ask a little bit about the access to uh, clean air. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have this shared and hollow microgrid that the governor's pro or NIPA is proposing to put in. Um, have you been in communication with them at all about this project? I know we had 24 legislators just signing a document to send along to him, uh, Governor Cuomo, um, urging him to, to sort of re go back to the beginning and, and start fresh on this. So Yeah, I've been uh, in conversations with NIPA and NYSERDA from the very beginning because I made it very clear that this is a community where there's still a lot of pain over the burn plant that was there and that when I talk to people who live in that neighborhood they talk about you know their aunt or their sister who they believe uh, died because of you know or had diseases that were caused by the burn plant and that that pain is very real and so I will really want to commend NIPA and NYSERDA and the DEC and OGS because they've done tremendous outreach in that community. When I talk to people who live in Sheridan Hollow, when I talk to the head of the Arbor Hill Neighborhood Association, they have been consulted from the very beginning. They've been given tours of the plant. They've been talked to about the project. And I want to commend the state for saying we're going to go back and we're going to see whether it is viable to have a renewable option, whether it's a geothermal option or what that option might be. But one of the things that I want to uh, speak to is this. No one wants to move to renewable energy more than 
mayors like myself or Governor Cuomo. He has stated this as one of his goals with respect to energy and renewable and fighting global climate change. And so I don't think that anyone would prefer more to be standing at a ribbon cutting in front of uh, a microgrid that is run by geothermal than Governor Cuomo. The question is whether it's possible, whether it is feasible. And if it's not feasible, what has been proposed is going to result in cleaner air for the neighborhood that's impacted. It is going to result in less noise from the current diesel backup engines that are there. And so we need to make sure that if we're saying that we really care about this community, that we come to a solution that really is going to be better for the community. Instead of saying, we're gonna leave everything exactly the way that it is because we can't use renewables and continue to run these diesel engines that have more emissions and that are louder and disruptive in the neighborhood. So I want to make it clear, I represent the residents of the city of Albany, and I want to ensure that if there is an opportunity to have cleaner air and cleaner emissions in that neighborhood, that's what I'm going to fight for and that's what I'm going to support. That said, that has to be proven, right? And so that has been what's on the table and what NYSERDA and NYPA are saying but clearly there needs to be a validation of that in the air emissions permits that they ultimately would put forward and receive. So, you know, this is one of the challenges, right? We ha you know, I have these passionate progressive values that I have, and I also have to recognize that there are feasibility and reality issues. And so, um, you know, how do we move that ball forward um, while also you know, fighting for those progressive values that we have. And before we started, um, you know, filming this part, <laughs> we spoke briefly about um, your new home and you said you were exploring solar and geothermal. Um, I don't know how much experience or how much time you had to sort of do that research, but um, what do you think the feasibility is in terms of exploring that kind of geo geothermal power? So, um, you know, the, the unique thing about the uh, townhouse that, we, that we're purchasing is that there's an empty lot next door, and um, we're in the process of acquiring that as well. And so that would provide potentially for the space to do geothermal, but you'd still probably have to dig down rather than yeah. laterally. And so um, the question is with the hard clay soil, you know, what is the feasibility going to be? And so uh, we certainly are gonna have, um, you know, that explored and determined. Uh, geothermal, just, you know, back of the envelope is still really expensive. So, you know, you start with, you know, the potential of it costing between forty and $50,000, and there are some tax credits which can help to reduce that. I really want to look at this from, again, that what's feasible. What could an average homeowner really be able to do in that environment? And so whether it's a combination of geothermal and solar, um, whether it's, you know, we ultimately say, okay, well, you know, we can't do geothermal, but we could do solar for our hot water. Um, so we're, we're, we're really exploring that. But I want to go through the process um, just as anybody would if they're making this decision so that we can demonstrate that um, these investments are financially feasible. Because, right, ultimately, we can't expect people to you know, spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, and not have there be an ability to have there be a return on that investment. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, I would love to see more tax credits and more incentives, which is what's so disappointing about the position of the current White House, because I thought that that's what we were going to be moving towards, right. is let's provide the incentives, let's build the industry, right? Because we know that once you build the industry and bring it to scale, that costs then mm -hmm. go down. So um, I, I'm excited about learning a lot more about it than uh, I ever thought um, possible. But, um, you know, that Sheridan Hollow plant is really in my new neighborhood. So, um, you know, I also yeah. am, am looking at that from the standpoint of um, being in a neighborhood that's impacted by it. So, a few more questions, I promise. That's okay. <laughs> We're almost done. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, looking at, uh, so, so we have a new convention center. We have bands coming in there. Uh, the TU has been refurbished, in, at least outside. And now we are talking about this giant project for the palace, which seems qu quite neat. But I'm wondering, 
what are your thoughts on Albany's capacity for entertainment? Um, are you concerned at all that, <laughs> that Albany might be full of, of these sort of large... You know, I think that what we're creating mm -hmm. is um, really a, a, a city that can provide venues that are meeting a demand that's mm -hmm. there, but that we didn't have the right venues for. And so, you know, um, there, you look at the Capitol Center, it's a perfect example, right? So uh, it's a venue that can bring in entertainment that, you know, there's no way they're gonna fill the Times Union Center and they might even not be able to fill the palace, but the Capitol Center is the perfect size mm -hmm. venue for them. And when you look at what the palace is thinking about with their expansion, and my understanding is that they're looking at a phased approach to the expansion, the first piece of that is really expanding the stage so that you can bring in the equipment that you know right. we've come to know and understand. Yeah. Create green rooms that aren't disgusting, so that fans who come actually want to come back. Right? Um, sorry, Palace. I mean, I know I'm, I'm an ex officio member of the board, and but I should say subpar. Mm. I'm, I'm, okay, <laughs> correct myself. <laughs> Um, they're not just, you know, they're clean, but they're just yeah. not, I mean, I've been, you've been back. Mm -hmm. there. So, um, but then they are also talking about a smaller venue. I think the important thing is that the arts work together. So you look at, um, the Broadway and other productions that happen at Proctor's in Schenectady and full disclosure, I'm on the board of Proctor's. So I'm in Schenectady quite a bit. Mm. Uh, and, uh, Proctor's also manages cap rep. And so I'm really excited about cap reps move and it's new space that it's um that it's uh, in the process of uh, refurbishing and so you know these are really exciting things and i think that they create more opportunities for a broader variety of um of venues and so you know we we need to continue to grow the population we need to continue to uh you know create more good paying jobs so that people have the ability to go out and spend those entertainment dollars but I, you know, I think that we're um, we're actually in a place where m more it's not m more for the sake of more. It's it's the right size venues for uh, the for an ability to expand the variety of, of entertainment that we have. Obviously, I don't need to tell you this, but your your uh, mayoral opponent, uh, Frank Camisso, obviously is very uh, loud and outspoken about the about the idea that we're giving away the palace um how do you respond to that i know you've responded to it before. yeah i mean you know i just i i fail to see that side of the equation full stop i mean there were appraisals that were done um this when i became mayor i inherited a 10-year lease mm -hmm. that the prior administration had given to the palace board for a dollar that required the city to pay for all maintenance of the building. There's about four and a half million dollars of deferred maintenance that needs to be done on that building. That's a liability for our taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So we've eliminated a liability. We have a funding stream going forward that is going to pay us over a period of time. Because the other thing that, you know, Mr. Camisso also, also often pointed out for, for the prior administration was the use of one shots, right? So you get $750,000, you're not going to get that the next year and you blow it all in one year. So this allows us to have a funding stream over a period of time. And it gives the palace the opportunity to do, you know, initially probably a 35 million and then eventually another $30 million project. Mm. That's construction jobs, that's new jobs for more nights, um, more business for our restaurants downtown. I mean, you know, you look at the economics of it and you look at other cities that have done similar things. And I think that we, um, are going to see a great return on that sale, not just the dollars that we're getting for it, but a refurbished, more programmed, more vibrant downtown. So finally, <laughs> we have, um, I should be honest, um, and I'm sure you haven't watched all of our podcasts, I should be honest and let you know that we've speculated about your future here before <laughs> while you weren't here. Um, and, you know, I've I've had conversations with many people close to you and many people who are following you, and they have wildly different ideas about what <laughs> Mayor Sheehan sees as her future. Um, so I'm sort of, I, I, I think part of it, I might be wrong, but um, is that you, you obviously you've, you've taken on a national profile in some respects. I felt like the campaign from your reelection was bigger than the, the mayor's office, but perhaps in some ways um, 
your different po- kind of politician than Jerry Jennings is, and, and that's the person we were, were used to for what sixteen years, eighteen years, twenty, twenty years, yeah. Um, and he clearly did not have his mind on anything but um, local issues, and and I think he was less, um, you know, he he was very much a, a guy who was at Joe Bruno's side or John Sweeney's side or whoever it was, um, you know, wasn't as much thinking about politics, but then, or not politics, I'm sorry, about party affiliation. But then again, I think we've seen the whole entire capital region change to be more democratic. And uh, But anyway, I digress. The, <laughs> the, so my, my question is, you know, I, I've, obviously there's the rumor about, about uh, you wanting to run for Congress, you thinking about X, Y, and Z. Rachel has told me, she sees you as more of a, a, a thoughtful sort of someone who might just ride off into the sunset having achieved what you want for the for the city. What what I mean, you know, is is your mind anywhere other than Albany at this point? No. And, uh, you know, I, I tell this to uh, particularly young people all the mm-hmm. time when they ask me about, you know, how can I become a mayor? Right. Um, I never thought I would become a mayor. And. Every job that I've ever had, I focused on doing the best that I can in that job and learning as much as I possibly can. And that has always led to other things. You know, I started out, I was a journalism major in college and I worked in television news. Gosh, and I worked in, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> um, I, I, I worked in, uh, you know, television production and that led to an interest in the law and you know led to law school and so i guess you know i know that people love to speculate but uh i'm not speculating i'm focused on the next four years on doing the best job that i can for the people who elected me to office they elected me to office to help to uh, bring the city forward and to focus on the issues that I promised that I would focus on and that's what I'm going to do and then you know whatever happens after that uh, will happen after that but I have no uh, you know uh, plan or predestined uh, ambition uh, to do anything other than to be the very best mayor that I can be and the reason that I will talk about national issues is because this is the capital of New York State and I have a voice and I represent people whose voice needs to be heard. And so if I can use this office to amplify the voice of the people of this city, um, many of whom are struggling, many of whom I, I think feel that they are not represented in Washington, then that's what I'm gonna do because I think that that's what I'm supposed to do. One final thing, <laughs> your, your, your office and, and you are very close to Senator Gillibrand. She's up for re-election, and I know a lot, there's a lot of speculation that she's also considering some sort of national you know, mm-hmm. uh, run for president, if not something else. Um, do you think she has an actual contest for the, her Senate seat at this point? Look, I think that you know every politician needs to take every uh, every election seriously and you know not take anything for granted and I think that Senator Gillibrand certainly is not going to take anything for granted I think that her voice is so important because she does speak to issues that are important to New Yorkers but also issues that are important on a national level and particularly that are important to women and girls yeah. and we have to ensure that we have those voices at the table and that they continue to be strong voices uh, for not just um, you know women but the issues that impact women in New York impact everybody in New York and you know whether or not a single mom has the ability to um, provide for her family and save for her family's future is critical to the you know viability of all of our communities moving forward and so um, you know I, I think that uh, she is going to do what uh, Senator Gillibrand does, which is to continue to be that voice and to take every, you know, um, opportunity to be out here um, in New York campaigning and and hopefully helping with um, some of these congressional seats as well. Would you like to see her take on a a bigger role, just personally? Look, I think that she is already taking on a bigger role from the standpoint of some of the issues that she has really been able to amplify. And she is seen as the person nationally to go to to talk about some of these issues. And so that's, you know, I I think a benefit for the um, for the state and a benefit for uh, the, um, you know, the, the issues that I care passionately about. And again, I. 
I'm a firm believer, right? Let's focus on what we're doing now. Right. The speculations about what's going to happen down the road is just that. It's speculation. A lot can happen between now and then. And, you know, again, it's the advice I give to people all the time. Don't lose sight of the job that it is that you've been hired to do. And if you focus on that and focus on being really good at it, then you can think about other things. But until you get that job done, you know, you need that's that's where your focus needs to be. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all the time. Is there Thanks. anything uh, that, that uh, are there any city events coming up? Anything you think our viewers should be aware of? Sure, um, sure. You know, we, um, you know, we, the, the winter months are, are ending. So, uh, you know, we've got, first of all, we have our um, city hall rotunda events. We've got another one on February 27th, uh, which is going to be a great Black History Month uh, event. Uh, but we also, you know, in no time we'll be in tulip festival season. Uh, we're going to have a delegation visiting us from Nijmegen, which is our sister city. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities to learn more about that unique relationship. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Live at five, we'll be here before we know it. So uh, lots of good <laughs> things happening. Thank you so much. Look forward to it all. Yeah, thanks.